Um, we've heard during uh, the previous very interesting session how innovation has been driving in the semiconductor industry. We'll try to focus in this one on how innovation can also help on climate. So following the COP27 Paris Agreement, countries now representing about 90% of world GDP have pledged to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions uh, to net zero by 2050. Carbon is also very high on all corporate boards' agenda, following pressure from investors, but also customers, and increasingly stringent regulation. More and more corporates are uh, uh, publicly stating their targets to net zero and are actively working on their decarbonization plans, which, by the way, very often uh, translates into uh, investments to modernize their industrial estates. But actively reducing um, the, uh, the, the CO2 emission will not suffice. Uh, a gap estimated to 10 gigatons of CO2 per year is estimated that will have to be removed uh, from the atmosphere uh, moving forward via nature-based solutions like reforestation or via technology-based solutions, namely carbon capture and sequestration solutions. Uh, as a result, energy transition and decarbonization uh, require massive investments. And as outlined and stressed by uh, IMF recently, there is so much that public budget uh, can fund on this front. So many countries um, like uh, Canada, Sweden or Singapore uh, have been imposing a tax on carbon emissions and uh, to foster proper behaviors, systems like emission trading systems, um, uh, schemes, sorry, are implemented in regions like Europe. Uh, whereby corporates are allocated, based on uh, uh, their carbon intensity, a given number of uh, free quotas per year, and overperformance can trade them on an exchange. The voluntary carbon market comes on top of these mandatory schemes or um, uh, compliance markets. Uh, issued on the back of carbon uh, avoidance or removal projects. Uh, the carbon credits are purchased by corporates eager to accelerate their path to net zero. So they are a way to channel and fund uh, projects and project developers uh, that otherwise would be very hardly bankable under traditional project financing criteria. So some refer to carbon credits as to the currency of decarbonization or the net of net zero. A few weeks ahead of COP28, this session is aimed at providing a, a little color around uh, the voluntary carbon market value chain. And it is my pleasure to host today um, uh, but panelists representing uh, innovative uh, startup solutions, starting with Mariam Almansouri, general manager of Rebound, Sam Atwood, founder and CEO of Air Capture, um, Christine, uh, Christine Ingilarison, uh, head of Capfix Development, uh, business development and commercialization. On Visio, we have Sam Jill, co founder and CEO of Silvera. And we will start now with a video interview of Annette Nazareth, who is the chair of the board of the Integrity Council for the Voluntary Carbon Markets, actively working on the foundations, uh, foundational principles of this market, which by nature is totally bottom-up and today unregulated. Let's listen to Annette uh, Nazareth.
It is my pleasure to open this panel about how can carbon credits contribute to net zero at the 2023 World Policy Conference with you today, Annette Nazareth. You are chairing the board of the Integrity Council for the Voluntary Carbon Market. What would you say are the main challenges of the voluntary carbon market right now? And how is the Integrity Council role uh, in that context? Well, first, thank you so much for inviting me to speak with you today. Um, I'll speak of the challenges first. I, I'm very excited about the possibilities, so I'll get the challenges out of the way. Um, I think it's very, very clear that we have an enormous challenge in fighting climate change. Uh, we have a shared goal that really transcends markets, sectors, portfolios, and geographies. This is a critical moment in our history. Um, and so the scale and urgency of the crisis really uh, demands that we use every available tool. Um, and as you know, we have emissions reductions as a centerpiece of this, and that is entirely appropriate. Decarbonization by corporates of their own operations and supply chains must be a priority. But unfortunately, it's too late now just to rely solely on corporate internal emissions reductions or even government action. And that's where the voluntary carbon market comes in. We have to accelerate our transition to net zero by using every tool in the toolbox. It's, it's as UN Secretary General Guterres has said recently, we need everything everywhere and all at once. And so the voluntary carbon market can be a really important solution, but, and we're very, very focused on this, only if it is rooted in high integrity. It holds the power to unlock urgently needed finance that would not otherwise occur and or otherwise be available for projects without, without voluntary carbon credits. And to quantify the opportunity the World Economic Forum has projected that the voluntary carbon market could remove 2.6 gigatons of CO2 by 2030. And Morgan Stanley projects that it could reach almost 100 billion in volume by 2030. So the Integrity Council for the Voluntary Carbon Market is an independent governance body committed to establishing high integrity voluntary carbon markets that can deliver real impact at speed and scale. And as I said earlier, it has the power to unlock private capital for projects to reduce and remove billions of tons of emissions that would not otherwise be viable. The other exciting thing is that it can channel funding to countries in the global south and help develop vibrant green economies. And it will support sustainable development goals by requiring all new projects to make a positive contribution to sustainable development, as well as having robust measures to protect people and the environment. But we know that today it's a relatively nascent market. It's unregulated. And if it's to scale and to live and to deliver on its climate goals, we need to address some of the critical issues that have arisen. So today the quality of credits in the market is at best inconsistent. Trading is fragmented and opaque, and not all carbon crediting programs impose consistent high quality standards. So ultimately it's fair to say that the voluntary carbon market today doesn't consistently meet the expectations of purchasers or the urgent needs of our planet. And this is a significant problem that limits the full potential to meet our climate goals. So we think we need to address a number of things. One is certainly standardization. Carbon crediting programs each have their own methodologies. They have differing rules of engagement and highly bespoke transactions that don't provide an environment for liquidity and transparency. Indeed, they create challenging market impediments. So we've created a global benchmark for high integrity carbon credits. The Integrity Council recently published the CCPs. Could you give us more color about the CCPs? Sure, I'd be happy to talk about the CCPs and importantly, how they underpin integrity. Uh, there are 10 core carbon principles and they fall into three categories. Those that relate to emissions impact, to governance and to sustainability. You know, it's really important that buyers have confidence 
that carbon credits are making genuine impacts on emissions. Carbon credits must fund reductions or removals that are additional, meaning that they would not have occurred in the absence of the incentive created by the carbon credit revenues. They have to be permanent. They have to be measured robustly and conservatively, and they can only be claimed by one party, which means there's no double counting of the credit. Programs that issue the credits also must meet high standards of governance to ensure that the overall quality of carbon uh, credits is high. They have to provide comprehensive and transparent information on the projects, issuing the credits so that people understand their impact on emissions, society, and the environment. They have to use a registry that uniquely identifies and tracks each credit from issuance to retirement or cancellation. And they have emissions reductions or removals verified <clears throat> by independent third party experts. And importantly, the CCPs also break new ground by requiring programs to ensure that high integrity credits come from projects with robust social and environmental safeguards that also deliver positive sustainable development impacts. That is, they make sustainable development a central part of the mitigation activity, not just a co-benefit. They must also support the transition to net zero and not lock in fossil fuel emissions or technologies. So in July, we published our CCP rulebook, which sets out the rigorous criteria we use to assess whether programs and categories of credits meet our high integrity threshold. Programs that we approve will be able to use the CCP label on credits, provided they have come from categories that we have also approved. So what do you see also on, uh, on the corporate side, right? On uh, the demand side, what do you see on the critical path to improve the, the uh, voluntary carbon market? Well, on the corporate side, you know, it's uh, it's important not only that we offer a supply of very high integrity carbon credits, but that corporates are using uh, carbon credits appropriately. Mm -hmm. And so the demand side of the equation is also critically important. And we're working very closely with what we call our sister organization, the Voluntary Carbon Markets Integrity Initiative. Uh, and VCMI is focused on the appropriate use of credits. Um, so basically at the Integrity Council, we're focused on the supply of credits and also on the, the ensuring that they, uh, the markets on which they trade are high integrity. And of course, we're looking at market mechanisms such as transparency and trade reporting and settlement issues. But VCMI is then focused on the demand side. So we like to say, that together we are creating end-to-end -end integrity in the voluntary carbon market. No, that, that's important because that's, uh, that's working um, from supply to demand. Um, so when looking forward, uh, what, what, what would success look like for the Integrity Council? How will you measure it? Well, of course, um, we're, we, we're very interested in seeing uh, the market scale up. As I've said, we don't want to scale the market unless it is rooted in high integrity, but we believe that there's enormous potential. And so, um, and in fact, we know that there's demand for high integrity products and thus we expect them to trade at a premium. And trading at a premium, of course, would create powerful incentives for project developers uh, to enhance their practices to come in line with our core carbon principles. And we expect the CCPs to drive continual improvement in the quality and impact of carbon reduction projects, ensuring that the market's contribution to emissions reduction aligns with the urgency of the climate crisis. Um, I think the CCPs will also establish standardized criteria uh, that will drive a shift towards increased transparency, but also exchange-based trading. Because when we have greater standardization, I believe a larger proportion of carbon credit trading will transition from what we have today, which is uniformly bilateral agreements, to transactions conducted through exchanges. And 
this transition would not only enhance market efficiency, but will also provide a platform for buyers and sellers to engage in transparent and fair pricing, which would drive broader market participation and liquidity. I mean, I should note when we talk about standardization, uh, I've often been asked, well, what are these CCPs to some extent? You know, what, what can you analogize to that I understand? And I like to say that the CCPs are akin to listing standards. It's as if we've imposed um, traditional regulatory principles onto the voluntary carbon market. So if you think of these um, CCPs as listing standards, the other element of them is that it, they also require not just a focus on essentially um, self-regulation of the product by the listing standards, but also self-regulation of the programs that issue the credits. Mm. And so um, bringing those principles to the market, I believe will create a greater confidence in the market, just as we have confidence in other high integrity, robust capital markets. And that's what we're seeking. We're seeking confidence, justifiable confidence based on high integrity. Um, frankly, we also expect robust trading of futures uh, mm -hmm. on voluntary carbon markets as the markets become more standardized. And that I think will create very important price signal because it will um, improve uh, hedging mechanisms for market participants. Um, it will provide important price signals. It'll also um, give project developers um, better ability to manage uh, their exposure to price risk. Uh, and this I think will make it less risky to launch new projects, again, particularly in the global south. So by implementing the core carbon principles and encouraging market participants to embrace these high integrity credits, we're creating an ecosystem where the value of emissions reductions are appropriately recognized and rewarded. <clears throat> and this will unlock, I believe, greater capital flows and drive innovation and catalyze the development and deployment of truly impactful climate solutions. Thank you, Annette. This, this is really very insightful and no doubt we're looking forward to the success of this entire ecosystem effort, because that's what we're talking about for the benefit of, of course, uh, climate change uh, and in general mankind. Thank you very much for your participation. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye bye. OK, so now let, let's move to uh, pragmatic examples of uh, carbon capture and sequestration solutions. And we'll start uh, with you, Matt. Thank you for having uh, made the trip out of the US to be with us today. So you have founded and you are the CEO of Air Capture, a nice name, by the way, for a carbon capture solution. Can you tell us uh, what uh, the solution is about? Yeah, I'm happy to. Thank you first very much for having us here today. So Air Capture is a company that develops direct air capture technology. And what we do is we build machines that have a fan. And the fan pulls uh, air through the machine. And the CO2, carbon dioxide from the air, is collected on the surface of substrates that are inside the fan. In about 15 minutes, we collect all the CO2. And then we inject heat in the form of typically waste steam or low temperature steam that releases the CO2 from the contactor surface, which we then collect and try to do something useful with. So we're selling the CO2 into various different markets and converting it into different products, such as fuels, beverage carbonation, agriculture, and building. Interesting. And Matt, um, uh, so at what stage are you in development of the solution? And uh, how, how fast can you bring it to industrial scale? A great question. Um, so, at present, what we are doing is we're commercializing the technology. So we've built several commercial machines uh, based on a large-scale development platform. And we're working on selling the CO2 into a variety of different markets. What I like to say is that the world's economy runs on carbon. Carbon is in all the products that we use and many of the products that run the global economy. So we're primarily working on beverage carbonation. Uh, we're producing dry ice for the cold chain. Uh, CO2 is used very predominantly in agricultural purposes. We have projects converting CO2 into chemicals and fertilizers, plastics, even battery materials for the energy transition. 
and fuels and energy products. Wonderful. Um, so uh, uh, thank you. We'll come back to, to, to you in a moment. Uh, I'd like now to move to uh, Christine. Christine, uh, with CarbFix, you're downstream in the value chain compared to uh, carbon capture. So what is CarbFix about? So uh, thank you for inviting me over here. Uh, so CarbFix, what we uh, do, we are simply imitating Mother Nature's way of storing uh, CO2. So with that in mind, our mission is to significantly contribute in the climate recovery by continuously innovating and by ways of, of, of improving how we can actually store CO2 by mineralization. How we do that, uh, I'm drinking here uh, Pellegrino sparkling water. So what we do, we simply dissolve CO2 uh, just like this and we inject it into the ground where it starts to mineralize into the bedrock itself. So we are not injecting gases, we are injecting sparkling water that has uh, the ability, Mother Nature's ability to mineralize into the bedrock. So if you move to the next slide, please, just as a simple um, chemical components in the bedrock itself. In our case, we need three ingredients. First, we need CO2. The second, we need basaltic rock. And the third, um, we need water. What we do here, we dissolve the CO2 into the actual, uh, d d dissolve the CO2 in water, and then we gently inject it into the bedrock. Once it reaches the bedrock at a very, very low depth, somewhere around on average 500 meters, it starts to mineralize. So the cationic ions in the bedrock itself, they get released, and the mineralization process takes place. The easiest way to ex explain it is that uh, the water is the means of transport. So we, we can say that the water is the train and the CO2 is the passenger. And once the train reaches the bedrock, the CO2 jumps off the train and the water carries on. So we are borrowing the water for a few, few minutes, but the mineralization, this happens in less than two years instead of what usually happens in millions of years. And this is a permanent solution. That's impressive. So, first of all, congratulations. In, in the previous slide, we've seen that uh, CapFix has made the cover page of National Geographic recent Thank issue. You. This is great. Thank you. And um, also, recently, you've signed um, a, an important contract uh, with the European Union uh, to, to sequestrate carbon uh, in Iceland. Does it mean that CapFix can only operate uh, in Iceland? No, uh, Iceland is a, we are an Icelandic company. So obviously we have been uh, piloting this and demonstrating this for quite some time. So originally uh, CarFix was, was uh, a research project between three universities, US, Columbia University in New York, Iceland, University of Iceland, and CNRS of the Toulouse in France, uh, with the, uh, the, the ambition of replicating Mother Nature's way. This is based upon basalt. Basalt is not uh, only limited to Iceland. It covers approximately 5% of all land on Earth, but approximately 70%, 70% of the ocean floor. So it definitely is not limited to Iceland, but Iceland is uh, the origin of the, of the research project and the company. So we are now uh, exploring uh, the globe, as we can say. Okay, what worldwide ambition then. Wonderful. Well, well we have... a. Uh, it's not a problem that's limited to, to UAE, US, Japan, or Iceland. It's a global problem. So we have to Absolutely. address it like that. Absolutely. So uh, carbon uh, capture, sequestration, you are so-called in the value chain project developers. Let's now turn to uh, the third party assessor <coughs> with Silvera. So Sam, Sam Gill, is co-founder uh, and CEO of uh, Silvera. We've heard from Annette Nazareth how uh, the principles are important uh, to set the basis for uh, proper qualification of um, projects from a carbon credit emission standpoint. So Sam, with Silvera, what's the role of a third party? How would you feature your role in the value chain? 
Thank you so much. So yeah, just to introduce Silvara and maybe we move on to the next slide. Silvara is a company that's providing data to the whole uh, private sector, but also the public sector to try and power the transition. So, so giving data that's actually showing the impacts and the climate impacts of various uh, investments that are made by the public sector or the private sector. And so when we're working in the uh, carbon markets, what we're trying to do is empower participants with data to show the real climate impact of any projects that they're investing in. And what we produce is essentially a, a ratings product showing the relative quality of each carbon offset uh, project. So the individual project that a, a corporate or a public sector participant might be investing in. And so the difference there when you compare our work with the ICVCM is as Annette says, that essentially the ICVCM is trying to produce listing standards, so almost a quality floor. And uh, the ICVCM is applying those CCPs at the program, the crediting program, and uh, the methodology level. Whereas what we do is we actually assess at the project level using very similar um, uh, pillars of assessment. So for example, our ratings actually assess the, 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 the CCPs that relate to climate integrity, but we're doing that at a project level. And so the three key pillars of quality that we look at are uh, the carbon performance of the project, so assessing the carbon accounting that the project produces itself. So is it, if it was, for example, a direct air capture project, we'd be looking at the life cycle analysis of the project, looking at the displacement effects of the power consumption. Or if, for example, we were looking at a forestry protection project, we'd be assessing, using our own machine learning and satellite data, we'd be assessing uh, whether the, the reporting that the project's produced is accurate. So looking at have, ha, has the project actually protected the amount of trees that it's claimed? Uh, how much carbon is stored in those trees? How much carbon is stored in the soil around it? And so we're essentially using an independent technical, technological stack to assess the claims of the project. The second thing we do is we look at the additionality of the project. So looking at the counterfactual the project's based on, and again, assessing at the project level, whether the methodology has been assessed and applied in an appropriate way, or whether there's been an overcrediting risk that's been introduced. And then the third thing we look at is the durability of these projects. So essentially what we're doing, again, is using a methodology, a technology stack to assess independently the claims of the project at the project level so that we can give um, a very, with a high degree of accuracy an assessment of the, the quality of each individual project. Um, so it's a very complementary approach to the, the methodology level assessments that are being applied by the ICBCM. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, great and, and and definitely you're bridging uh, corporate demand to the the project uh, uh, at the project level. So uh, we we've heard um, efforts on the uh, ICVCM uh, front. What would you see as the key uh, factors for uh, boosting the the voluntary carbon market moving forward? Given your position in the in the value chain, Sam. That's a really interesting question. In many, many ways, that's the million dollar question. I think, you know, I spend a lot of time uh, with C-suite executives in the private sector, but also policymakers uh, around the globe who are kind of wrestling with this. And I think, um, you know, Annette really helpfully split the, the, the problem into the two sides. You've got the supply side uh, quality problem, and then you've got the demand side integrity problem. On the supply side, I think we're very close to getting to an answer. The data, uh, the data sort of approaches that are being applied by folks like ourselves, Silvera and others, are, are allowing us to get to with quite a high degree of accuracy and granularity and assessment of the quality of any individual project. And we're also uh, increasingly strengthening the methodologies uh, that they use to produce these credits. But I think what the world needs to agree on is what is the paradigm that we're working to. We're not going to be able to get to absolute 100% certainty on the accounting around any of these projects, frankly. Um, and we also need to come to a clear paradigm around the permanence or durability requirements that we're going to ask the market to um, meet. So, for example, if we were all to agree that if um, you know a carbon credit needs to be stored, uh, storing uh, carbon for 100 years, for example, to um, to be acceptable, that would allow the market to start engineering, for example, horizontal or mm. vertical stacking approaches to allow different types of carbon to be used in, in, in portfolios. And it would allow us to start regularizing and standardizing the market. But at the moment, there's no clear consensus there 
on what the what the actual quality paradigm we're working towards is. So I think there needs to be a clear, um, accepted uh, consensus around uh, the quality paradigm we're working towards. And then on the flip side, uh, Annette referred to the work of the VCMI, which is the um, demand side integrity body. But again, what is needed is a much wider consensus around what are we asking corporates to do in terms of compensation? So where they're not able to reduce their emissions to absolute zero, what are we asking them to do? What do they get to claim if they compensate uh, their emissions with with carbon credits? Um, and um, what what will they what benefit will they actually receive for that? Are they going to get tax breaks? Are they going to get preferential treatment in the in the capital markets? Mm -hmm. um, are they going to be uh, rewarded in some way? Because the private sector can't act as a charity. So I think that those consensuses on uh, the supply side integrity and the demand side integrity paradigms are completely necessary to allow the market to now move forward and scale. Clearly, uh, a, a typical market dynamic between supply and demand. So th thank you. For, uh, that's uh, that's insightful, Sam. Uh, I'd like now to to uh, to move to another area which is important for climate uh, in general. And uh, Mariam, um, you're uh, you're leading um, a Rebound, uh, which is uh, which is um, uh, an exchange for a recycled plastic. Clearly, um, the overwhelming development of plastic production is deeply contributing to CO2 emission, but also is a massive uh, waste issue for the planet and uh, pollution is also bad for our health. So how is Rebound helping on that front? Um, so first of all, good morning everyone and it's my pleasure to be between um, all of you here today. Regarding Rebound, what we want to solve is the plastic pollution problem. And given that virgin plastics is a valuable commodity, we believe that recycled plastics is just as equivalent. Um, there is no scientifically and environmentally proven, and as well as economically proven material, um, that can substitute plastics today, mainly because it's a very versatile and useful material. Now, while there are certain types of plastics and additives and chemicals that need to be, um, let's say, deleted from the uh, chain, uh, there are many other precious types of plastics which can be recycled and have a market for it. However, um, just like carbon markets, um, the recycling market of plastics specifically is very opaque and fragmented. So how do we build trust and transparency today between businesses, directly between buyers and sellers, globally around the world, to be able to facilitate the trade of recycled plastics in a quality assured and regulatory compliant manner? So that's exactly what we do and what we address. And of course, no better way to reach a global audience and a global market than through a platform. That's where digitalization comes in. That's where marketplaces come in. And that's where um, I believe a neutral facilitator such as ourselves helps facilitate this trade um, in a way where the private sector fulfills demand and supply gaps, but also the public sector is comfortable in the type of non-hazardous materials um, we're creating a market for. Wonderful. and. Uh uh, by the way, uh, you are the only Gulf uh, startup having been awarded the label uh, Tech Pioneer by the World Economic Forum uh, earlier in the year, so congratulations. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's awesome. So uh, definitely plastic waste uh, collection and recycling comes with a cost. And uh, th this, is th this is very important. Uh, and this is why some are uh, promoting the notion of uh, extended producers' responsibility and also the notion of uh, plastic credits to, to make the value chain uh, affordable. So wh what's your view on that? So definitely, um, the recycling plastics market today faces a challenge of you know, typically this is an economy and I have a background in finance. So, you know, I need to look for the dollar sign. And 
when I started Rebound, I came to understand why there's a pollution problem, because financially, companies won't pay more to introduce recycled plastics in their finished product if the virgin plastic is cheaper. And we cannot just sit and wait um, for regulations to kick in and, and policies to enforce, because how much can law enforce at the end of the day when it is applicable in one region but not applicable um, in the other? I also come from a uh, government and policy background, uh, having worked for the Cabinet of Ministers, so I am aware of what, up to what can the public sector kind of uh, lay on the ground, but then how will the private sector start to react? So when it comes to credits in, in the plastics um, recycling space, it's important to offset that barter and negotiation price that buyers want to drive down. For instance, if today virgin PET is being sold at around $900 a ton, um, recycled PET is being sold at around $1,100 or $1,200 per ton. So that roughly $300 difference, the seller of the recycled plastics cannot drive the price as low as 900 because that means that they'll be operating at a loss and unfortunately that's why a lot of recyclers cannot stay in business. The opportunity that credits present here is that it's an alternative revenue model. So instead of just benefiting from selling off the tangible material, they can also benefit from selling the credits that are generated. And, you know, while some people might um, push for extended producer responsibility only on the producer side or, you know, pointing the finger at just one entity or one company will not help solve the pollution crisis. It's that entire value chain and stakeholder value chains, including governments and municipalities, that will help capture this material being separated at source, generate that collection credit, beyond that, moving it to an ethically responsible and environmentally capable company which can recycle these plastics and then put it back into the market, such as our marketplace, where the buyer and seller can deal directly. And there's that um, ultimate level of transparency when it comes to quality too. Interesting and, and, and clearly we, we see that uh, solutions exist and technology is already uh, here that can be used. The question is how fast can we deploy and how fast can we enforce adoption? So uh, uh, funding is on the critical path and affordability of these investments is also, we, uh, plastic is also a perfect example. So Christine, um, it looks to me that uh, the, the cap fix solution of carbon sequestration into soil is, is pretty uh, universal. Right, you're talking about uh, uh, that there is a, a large component of oceans where we can uh, apply this solution as an example. So, um, uh, can it be used also at a point source solution? And uh, uh, how is it's, uh, your solution is also, in my view, eligible to uh, both compliance markets? and voluntary carbon markets, so a dual source of financing. So what will it take to enforce wide adoption of, the, of your solution in particular? <coughs> yeah, very good question. Um, I don't have the silver bullet, but <laughs> well, I mean the, the magic answer here, but uh, in regards to how we are approaching things, yes, uh, this solution that we are offering, we're not saying it is a silver bullet, but as was mentioned before by Annette, we need all the solutions. This solution can be applied on the voluntary market, yes, and it can also be applied on the mandatory market. Uh, if you look at uh, my closest uh, samples, uh, as examples are European market. You have a, a trading scheme, ETS, where you have the government that has the stick on the companies. If you don't do this, you have to pay a certain tax or pay a certain fine. However, in the US, you're looking at the carrot, where if you do this, you will be incentivized. So it doesn't really matter which method it is, and it will most likely be a combination of both. You mentioned before, yes, we have uh, had the privilege of, you know, uh, let's say, starting this research in 2006. We incorporated the company three and a half years ago with the ambition to scale up and commercialize. Mm -hmm. 
We did receive a huge grant from the European Commission uh, earlier last year, uh, about 115 million euros, to build the world's largest mineral storage site, which will be done in Iceland. So it is a combination of uh, subsidizing or, or grants, but at the same time, uh, the, the uniqueness of, of, of the CARFIS technology, it is already economical. Just the, if you look at the entire value chain that we have two commercial operations in Iceland, uh, the capturing, the transport, and the actual mineralization, or the storage by mineralization, is less than $25 per tonne. That's a very, very low mm. number. But at the same time, it's a totally different aspect than, than, than others have. We need all the technologies. Uh, this is one of them. And our main objective is now to scale up on a global basis uh, and, 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 let's say, uh, be available because we don't have time. Definitely, we don't have time. That's, uh, that's uh, also a question for you, um, Sam. Uh, the, the air capture solution is a deep engineering solution. So uh, certainly it's capital intensive to develop long cycles. Uh, and um, how, how do you match these long cycles with the financing available on the market? Is it easy? And how do you see um, affordability moving forward? In other words, uh, how costly is it uh, for companies to, uh, to remove carbon? How do you see your solution addressing this in a, a cost-affordable way? That's a great question. I mean, I think it comes down to initially the question between avoidance and permanence. Um, you know, one pathway is to avoid carbon emissions, but that could also be counted as taking post-combustion emissions and, uh, and sequestering them. But permanent removal is different. So what we're focused on is permanent removal of CO2 from the atmosphere by capturing the CO2 and then trying to do something useful with it. But when you come to the question of scale and time frame, this, I think, really focuses uh, us very much on our thesis, which is solve for scale. If we take a look at um, the latest IPCC uh, AR6 report, and we look at the required time frames that are necessary in order to avoid two degrees of warming, and we take a look at how much capacity addition of negative carbon infrastructure technology is required to have a reasonable confidence interval of avoiding the worst existential threats of climate change, it is quite significant. We're talking about needing to scale this technology to the point where we're at about 1.5 to 1.8 gigatons of new capacity year over year by 2045, and that's only to have about a 90% confidence interval of avoiding two degrees of warming. And I'll say here now that 1.5 degrees, avoiding 1.5 degrees is totally impossible. We will, not be, we will not achieve that goal. So our focus is how can we develop and scale technology as quickly as possible mm -hmm. and get that technology to work and get on the learning curve. Mm -hmm. So we're focused on kind of two pathways. One is direct CO2 capture to sequestration. We're working with uh, injection sites uh, like CarbFix is doing. And we're developing projects in the US uh, here in the UAE and in Oman, where we're capturing CO2 from the air and injecting it. But these are long tail projects that are high capital intensity and require specifically offtake agreements for the carbon credits. And the tenor of those offtake agreements has to match what it would require to finance those projects. That's a big problem. Right now in the market, with, especially within the VCM space, those offtakes are not necessarily bankable. And we have to find a way to convert those carbon credit offtakes or bilateral agreements into scalable project financing and to move into that project financing as quickly as possible to get on the learning curve as quickly as possible. So I think the, you know, the other side of the coin is where I see this technology having huge impact is in industrial decarbonization. Corporates uh, can choose to inset this technology within their value chain and use the carbon dioxide directly within their products or to convert it into other products. Uh, and this, in many cases, has a larger impact than even in permanent removal or storage because the carbon intensity of the incumbent CO2 supply is oftentimes two, three, or four times the amount that's consumed. So uh, one of the things that I think is challenging is as we move forward to the VCM and we think about how do we create new standards, new practices, and you know, core carbon principles, 
Um, it makes a lot of sense on the nature-based side, but as we develop new engineering and hard tech solutions, and as we figure out how to deploy these solutions and get them financeable, we have to be careful not to box ourselves in too much. So issues around uh, the question of permanence is a major issue, because there are certainly examples where this technology can be used to offset uh, existing emissions, and it will have a bigger impact than taking that same molecule of CO2 and putting it into the ground. It may have a three to one or a five to one impact, but that still wouldn't meet the permanence requirement. And then the question of additionality is very important because uh, it is not necessarily, it should not necessarily be the case that a project requires, the project economics requires there to be a carbon market uh, offtake in order to finance this infrastructure. That does two things. One is it makes the projects much harder to finance and less bankable. And two is it slows down the scale of adoption. And the scale of adoption is, is I think, the most critical part of getting the costs down, particularly as it, as it relates to, uh, to CDR technologies. Wright's Law says if we, double, if we double capacity, every doubling of capacity, we get about a 15 to 20 percent reduction in costs. So you can pick a random number right now in terms of how much it might cost to pull CO2 out of the air call it $600 or $500 a ton, and you could say after about 60 plants that one builds, you could be well down the cost curve of well under $100 a ton, which we think is well within target of the technology we're developing. The question becomes, how do you deploy that technology as rapidly as possible, get on that cost curve, but do it in a way that's financeable and bankable so that we can get to scale quickly? Definitely, uh, corporate adoption for their own industrial usage, and we see that both these solutions could be dual track, right? Both on uh, uh, reduction, avoidance, and um, uh, removal. Uh, it's is a way to channel more funding, and this is absolutely needed to accelerate uh, pace and uh, wide adoption. So this is very insightful, uh, thank you. Maybe we have a couple of questions, uh, a couple of minutes uh, for questions if, uh, if there are in the rooms before we break for lunch. Uh, is there a micro? Yes. Yes. Well, Friedbert Pfluger from Berlin. Uh, I, I just want to say this was a fascinating debate. Uh, I learned a lot and my question is to uh, uh, Mariam, um, we have the COP in front of us, uh, before us. So, isn't these uh, aren't these topics uh, important enough to be placed in the very heart of uh, the COP again agenda? Uh, I, I mean, we we heard yesterday, Mr. Fabius, Monsieur Fabius talking all the time about renewables, which of course we all know is very important. But the uh, potential of getting CO2 out of the atmosphere or store it uh, underground is so tremendous that we perhaps should put a stronger emphasis on CCS and carbon capture use uh, in the COP process. And that would be fantastic if your country could pave the way for that. Of course, thank you so much. And um, as per what I'm aware of within the COP28 team, I do know that carbon is a, a very prominent topic. I think it's going to have the major focus of the conversations which would be driven. Uh, given also the space of business that I'm in, I'm aware that uh, a lot of carbon capture technologies, trades of, of uh, carbon credits and exchanges are going to be coming soon. So I commend the COP28 team ahead of time, but I'm sure we'll all be um, happy and, and satisfied with the results once COP is over uh, in Dubai. So inshallah, more positive news soon. Sorry, if I, additional question. Matt made this uh, suggestion of uh, financing uh, startups uh, in the direct air capture field, for instance. Uh, isn't that also something where, where you should engage? We heard uh, Mrs. Al-Mahiri yesterday saying that you want to put an emphasis on financing tools. So I think this is a wonderful idea of Matt, and if that could be part of the agenda of COP, it would be a tremendous success. Yeah, 
Thank you. Yeah, so those are all very exciting uh, solutions. The question is, how do you scale them? And what percentage of the overall problem do you think you could solve, you know, each of you in your different areas, of course? I, I can start. Um, so from, from uh, Carpex's point of view, we are commercial. So we are operating two projects uh, in Iceland. The third one is about to start next year. Uh, the matter for the technology, it, it's not, um, we are replicating exactly how we're doing things. So it's, it's a matter of uh, in, injection wells. So it's a matter of finding the, the right uh, subsurface, let's say the right geology. Uh, the cost uh, for us is already there, uh, the cost benefit. It's about policy. It's about regulations in each country, in each state. They are different. Uh, I mentioned before, I cannot emphasize uh, timing is something we don't have. We don't have time. Uh, so coming here and educating people about the possibilities, uh, that's the most important. But, but uh, policy is the biggest obstacle, absolutely. Matt, on your view? I would, uh, I would second that notion, but I would also add that really I think project finance is at the core of the scalability issue. It, it provides two functions. First is the project development itself. So figuring out how we can make these projects bankable and scalable, independent of what the costs of, uh, the, of the removal is or the product is at this point in time is on the critical path. Because as we scale the technology, even in the earliest stages and highest cost, highest risk of the technology, we are still able to beat the incumbent industrial gas or fuel companies on price parity by pulling CO2 out of the air and making the exact same product. That's, that's without counting carbon credits and things like this. So if we can start banking these projects and scaling it, that will then enable us to start scaling the manufacturability of the facilities. And getting manufacturing up is what we're focusing on right now. So our vision is that these machines should be built like cars are built today. And how do we get from here to there? Once we achieve the automobile scale of manufacturing, our analysis is, you asked a question about what size of the problem could it solve. Um, if we made enough direct air capture machines that are, that's roughly equivalent to the uh, total number of automobiles manufactured uh, per year today, that would solve 100% of the problem. Now, of course, direct air capture is not going to be 100% of the problem, and there's a question of the solution, and there's a question of energy costs and capital costs and all these things. But if we look at it as, as, as an infrastructural investment, we have to keep in mind that these negative carbon technologies are additive over the lifetime of the project. It's very different than renewables, where you, you build a wind or solar plant, and it doesn't produce carbon. Every year over the 20, 30 year lifetime of these assets, these are, these are removing carbon dioxide. And so I think we have to take a different approach and a different policy approach to thinking about how we can backstop these financings, how we can provide technology performance guarantees, and how we can provide creditworthy offtake agreements that are bankable. Wonderful. Any other question? Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm Randy Cotty, I'm the head of the Regional Economic Service in the south of France, so I'm also going to adver advertise for my country. We're investing a lot in carbon capturing, so reach out if you want to invest in France. Uh, my question is, uh, Christian, you mentioned $25 per ton. Matt, you mentioned something like 500, 600. Can you give us a ballpark estimate of where the industry is right now in terms of cost per ton captured, and how far down the line can we go on that cost optimization that you mentioned as well? Thank you very much. I, I will start from, so, so we're looking at, uh, I mean, we, we su support one another. So, so, so Matt is, is, is starting by, by catching, I'm taking and then uh, getting rid of it. So together we, we jointly do this. So from the, from the storage part, uh, this is a public uh, paper we, we, have, we have published, so, so there's no, no secrets there. And transparency is of course very important here. So we do have our proprietary capturing technology uh, to capture using water scrubber. Uh, that cost is approximately $20 per ton, but that's using a type taking directly from geothermal steam. We transport it and then we inject it into the ground, so the, the rest of the cost is less than, less than $5. But this is a, a scenario in Iceland. So 
we are working on this uh, large uh, project we call the Coda Terminal, which is uh, 3 million tons will be uh, mineralized every year, transported from mainland Europe to, to Iceland in a liquid form. The cost there will probably be, uh, I would say, around uh, minimum 25 euros per ton. That is just for the storage part. But this is a first of a kind. So by scaling up and by you know, having it closer to the source, the cost will be lower, just like it is in Iceland. The, um, <clears throat> the costs associated with direct air capturing, kind of where we can get to, um, we're well on the target of getting below $100 a ton of, of CO2 captured from the air. But pulling CO2 out of the air, it's like, pardon my, pardon the way I'm speaking, but so what, who cares? That's not useful. A CO2 has to be a liquid or a high-grade liquid or a supercritical fluid. So we have to integrate systems in order to get the CO2 to a saleable form or to an injectable form. Um, and that requires putting more systems together, and that requires additional energy costs and additional capital cost. So when you break down what the overall costs of atmospheric CO2 removal via direct air capture is, today there are some companies that have published results of where there are at, and it typically ranges in the $600 to $800 per ton range. Um, but this cost is heavily dependent upon the cost of energy. So as we scale up manufacturing and, and, and cost down the technology, we see no way with a capital cost contribution of, of the technology over a 10 or 20 year amortized uh, project life cycle can't be in the 20 to 30 to 40 dollar per ton range. And then if you take the energy cost associated with moving, we have to move 3,000 tons of air for every one ton of CO2 that we capture. So if you take the energy cost required to do that and to convert the CO2 into a saleable product, we can estimate that that's about 1,000 kilowatt hours per ton of CO2. So at 10 cents a kilowatt hour, that's 100 bucks. So we are well within the range, uh, even at market priced uh, power, that's, that's, that's retail price power, to be in the $100 a ton uh, uh, range over time. But that assumes that we take good progression along the learning curve. And so the question becomes, how do we iterate on, on that as rapidly as possible? But I see no technological reason why we can't achieve $100 a ton uh, direct air capture within the next five to 10 years. So we take that as a promise, and uh, I believe uh, with this, uh, with, uh, yes, Matt, yeah, it's on stage. So uh, I think we'll, this, uh, we'll, we'll close the panel because it's time for lunch. Uh, we thank you for your attention, and uh, I thank all the panelists, and, and, and Sam, thank you for having made the time mm -hmm. very early, uh, London time, to be with us in Visio. And, um, Thanks again and have a nice lunch. Yeah. Thank you.